All right, we are live. So, hi, everyone. I'm really excited for this session. Uh, thanks a lot, Aniket, for your time to do this. And th there is a, a, like a lot of insightful content lined up. And few things uh, about Aniket is like he did his undergrad at IIT Bombay in computer science, and now he's uh, almost done with the masters at UIUC. And he, he got involved with Adept House project, uh, which is uh, the project I was working on for to design and build a sustainable house in the community. And he he was in the development team. That's how I got to know Aniket. And he is such a sport. And like if you check out his work, it's incredible. So thanks a lot, Aniket, for your time to do this. And I'm really excited for this. Yeah, uh, thanks Mayur for inviting me as well. And uh, this is like a really nice opportunity for me to talk about uh, whatever I have learned at UIC and just to share my experience with people. I just uh, love to do it. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm happy to be here. Yep. Okay. So uh, I think uh, we are ready to start the workshop. Yeah, all right. Um, let me quickly share my screen. All right. So there's this problem with the Linux app, uh, app of Zoom. So I have to join from my browser here. Um, but yeah, I guess that won't be a problem. Um, yeah, so let's get uh, started. Um, so as Mayur introduced me, uh, hi all, I'm Aniket. Uh, I graduated from IIT Bombay Computer Science in 2019, and uh, I directly joined UIC for my master's uh, in computer science, uh, and I'll be graduating in like a week now. And today I'll be talking about uh, IoT, uh, and uh, which means the Internet of Things, and I'll be talking more about my experiences of what uh, I have done with IoT. So since like uh, undergrad, I was very interested into uh, computer networks and systems. And uh, then I sort of got introduced to this world of uh, Internet of Things. And uh, as I started to get to know uh, a lot about it, I was very intrigued about it. And um, today I'll just uh, touch upon a lot of the basic uh, stuff which goes up with I IoT. And uh, then we can sort of dive into uh, some of the fundamentals which uh, enable such IoT systems. And we can also, I'll also walk you through some of the, uh, some demos which I have lined up for you uh, so that you can understand uh, the implementation details of some of the basic systems as well. Um, so I have lined up my content uh, in terms of these sections. So first of all, we'll start off uh, with an introduction, I'll just introduce what IoT is and in what different field we have uh, IoT uh, uh, develop. And uh, then we'll uh, uh, dive into the devices which are used in IoT. Um, so like uh, what kind of sensors, microcontrollers or actuators are used in the Internet of Things. And uh, then we move on to the protocols, which uh, which define how these devices talk with each other, uh, and that's pretty interesting. And that's pretty much that pretty much forms the backbone of uh, all these IoT systems. Because if you remember, the I of uh, IoT stands for the Internet, so we should know how the protocols work. Um, and then we can we can move uh, into a demo of a normal AQI monitoring system. Uh, so AQI means uh, air quality index. And uh, we'll then move into uh, some of the data management pieces about how uh, data is managed in, in such IoT scenarios. Uh, and then we'll move on to uh, some of the upcoming trends, uh, which is edge computing. And then we'll sort of conclude with uh, the security issues in IoT. So all things are not well, and there is still a lot of progress which needs to be made uh, in this uh, field. Um, so just uh, just take a pause. Is my camera working? Uh, I'm not sure. No, I, I don't uh, think so. I guess uh, it just switched off. All right. So, so, yeah. 
Awesome. Yeah, because I have this webcam right here, and it blinks red whenever my camera is on. So it's like, okay, this is not red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not that it matters, but yeah. All right. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, so let's on. Uh, let's start with the introduction. Um, so what is uh, IoT and uh, to be frank, this has been like a buzzword uh, for like quite some time right now. Um, I think since 2014, 2015, uh, since people have started uh, connecting things to the internet, uh, the, possi the possibilities have been sort of limitless uh, as to what we can achieve with these devices. Uh, to put it up simply, uh, the internet was sort of uh, founded uh, way back, and it was sort of a closed-knit community uh, of researchers who wanted to share their uh, research papers uh, with each other. And that's how ARPANET was sort of formed. And then uh, it was open to the public, and uh, it just boomed into the full-fledged uh, internet we have right now. And using that internet, uh, we can connect, uh, we can get connected to each other, we can uh, communicate with each other, send messages to each other and uh, whatnot. And then uh, slowly people started uh, connecting uh, different, different things uh, to the internet itself. So something like a printer, uh, which was used to be uh, like a local entity. Uh, now people had started connecting printers to a local network where you can just uh, send something to print over the network and print any document. And uh, as things uh, moved uh, rapidly and as uh, people in the EC department started shrinking their devices into tinier and tinier modules, uh, people were able to get computation on very small devices. And uh, there was a rapid rise in sort of intelligent devices which can do intelligent things. And we started seeing more of these devices getting connected to the internet. And that's what this uh, picture is all about. So the internet of things is essentially like uh, normal common occurring things, uh, such as watches, uh, lamps, uh, microphones, uh, any sort of uh, cameras, such things getting connected to each other via the internet. Um, and there are like lots of applications uh, and use cases uh, which have developed in the past years about how we can use these devices uh, in this setting. So uh, I'll start off with like uh, the Adapt House setting and uh, I'll just give like a brief overview of uh, how IoT can be used to achieve home automation. Uh, so I'm sure Mayur will be knowing this much better than me. Uh, and since I was like in the development team, I know sort of some, some some of the specifics of this. So just to like briefly summarize uh, how IoT can be applied in home automation, uh, we usually have uh, like so the the normal things at our home, such as uh, an electric plug, or let's say a light bulb, or even the HVAC system. All these things can be connected to each other or to a centralized entity. Uh, using the IoT paradigm. And as we can see in this diagram here, uh, in this figure, you can see that there is a door lock, uh, there is a thermostat, a security camera, uh, a smart lighting, a smart plug, and some really smart sensors. Um, all of them are connected to each other via some common gateway using uh, the specific protocol. Uh, like some, some are BLE, Wi-Fi, Z-Wave, Zigbee. And then uh, these devices are connected to the internet cloud where uh, you sort of process all the information coming from these devices. And then you provide the user with an interface with which you can create, with which you, you can control uh, literally any device in your house. And, uh, may, and you can do this remotely without being present in the house itself. So let's say if you're driving home from a long, uh, day of work and you want your oven to be hot and your uh, house to be at that specific temperature uh, at which you like, then you can just uh, make that happen using your phone and 
by the time you drive back home in like 30 minutes uh it's already there for you your oven is preheated and uh your room is uh, set to the right temperature the the music system is playing the right kind of music uh so that's the power of home automation and uh, i believe mayu did something similar for adapt house uh where we wanted to make the house more sustainable and we worked on i think power efficiency um and energy consumption uh to achieve this so that's the first use case and a very normal use case which people encounter so if you even uh, google about iot there will be like lots of uh, diy projects or do it yourself projects where you can basically connect a simple led bulb uh, to a, to an arduino and you can light that up or you can control uh some sort of uh, functionality at your house like a smart toaster or a smart washing machine with some device um and this is like a very basic uh, use case of iot but moving on uh iot has been also applied in the industries uh to automate lots of things so first of all uh the the very uh, useful uh application of uh, iot in industry is for manufacturing and warehousing where you can sort of replace human labor uh, which is used for like let's say quality checks or even for um, checking the inventory like how, how much content is in there in the warehouse you can replace human labor with uh, automated sensors which can do that job for you and there have been uh, multiple applications as well like uh, robotics uh, or even smart power utilities and all these applications have a uh, huge business impacts so as you can see this on this chart on the right hand side here uh, we can see that there is improved operational efficiency there is improved productivity and uh, it also enhances uh, the entire end to end uh, workflow uh, chain of uh, of the business itself because you don't need a uh, human labor to do mundane tasks uh, which can be automated by sensors itself so industrial iot has been uh, on the rise i think since uh, the last few years um moving on iot can be also used in medical and uh, in the healthcare industry as well uh and this is a very sensitive use case uh and one which needs to be particularly uh done carefully uh so uh let's say we have a patient right now and we cannot be with that patient uh for a long time so uh one way to do it is that uh let's say usually we need a we need a nurse or a doctor to monitor that patient constantly just to see whether anything is happening to him or her uh, at any point in time or not but uh, we can sort of automate this task by uh, up by giving the patient some wearable devices um, such as a fitbit or some more specialized device uh, fitbit is like the least uh, fancy thing which we can use to monitor a patient but there have been specialized iot devices which monitor a patient and using that device and the data coming from that device we can actually create an alerting system where if the health of the patient deteriorates uh, at any point in time then you can clearly uh, signal or, or alert a doctor or the or the nearest nurse uh, to attend to that uh, patient so that's uh, one of the most sensitive use cases of iot and in this case we need to make sure that uh, the person uh, that the devices are properly calibrated and we have as uh, as little mistake mistakes as possible um and yeah this is sort of the workflow uh, you can see that uh, there is a wearable device there's a patient uh, of which of who's we are monitoring the heart rate and the blood pressure sensor and then uh, we send this data to an iot cloud which uh, sort of processes this data in real time and then we can obtain firstly uh, health reports so uh, we can do like an alerting system but we can also do retrospective querying on that data so we can see how that pers person behaved 
uh, in the past uh, day or the past week and we can see how uh, the health of that patient uh, is improving or deteriorating over time so that's one of the use cases of uh, medical iot um now there's another upcoming uh, an, an upcoming trend in applying iot in the uh, automotive sector so all of you guys must be familiar with tesla and how the stocks of uh, tesla are uh, just uh, touching the roofs right now and that's because uh, they are doing something really really innovative which has not been explored by mankind before uh, and they are trying to build uh, a self driving car so one might uh, believe or someone who is familiar with self driving cars they might uh, feel that cameras are only are the only thing we need in a self driving car uh, but in the future uh, let's say we have our streets filled with only self driving cars and that's like a very uh, real possibility we we don't need just cameras to see what the ongoing traffic is or what all is happening um, in uh in in the field of vision but we also need to have some sort of sensors which uh easily detect proximity so if there are like two cars they should be able to talk to each other that hey i am near to you and uh it's just not about the camera uh camera vision but it's a, it's also about having like connected cars in the future and that's the next uh generation paradigm uh, which is sort of coming up and even apart from that uh, i'm talking about things which are in like uh, 10 15 years we can actually uh, see lots of sensors being uh, built into our own car itself so if you have any modern car you can see that it comes with like loads and loads of functionalities um, so just to see some of uh, the functionalities you can have nighttime ped- pedestrian warning uh, we have like drowsiness sensors which sort of monitor uh, the drowsiness of a person by measuring the body temperature or the heart rate or the way their pupils dilate so there are there have been like lots of uh, lots of upgrading uh, done in the modern car itself and if you pick any vintage car and any modern car in this generation we definitely have like hundreds of sensors built into that car to optimize different uh, different things in the fi- in the car driving pipeline so automotive iot is uh, on a on on a huge uh, rise very recently another use case of iot um, is in retail so uh, this this uh, application is very uh, centric in uh, profiling your customers so let's say you are uh, shopping in some market let's say let's say we we are going to this county market in champagne we have and you just go in there and uh, you just buy some stuff and you get out so that's what has what has been happening right now but uh, in the future we can have uh, custom profiling of users by uh, using iot devices so what uh, we can do is that uh, let's say if you are in uh, so the first step in uh, achieving uh, achieving uh, achieving uh, targeted advertisements in iot is that you need lots of devices placed uh, in the shop itself so how this works is that these devices will sort of uh, localize a customer in the shop so you provide uh, us provide the system a map of the shop and the locations at where uh, the devices are placed and once you sort of localize uh, which w- once you localize each customer in that shop then you sort of know their shopping trends as well as to how the uh, customer is walking through your shop and how do you need to design your shop and how you should place your items so that they get sold easily so that some of the things uh, which iot can enable in the future uh to sort of profile customers and they can sort of uh provide preferential discounts to you they can uh specifically target some advertisements for you 
and uh, so on and so forth. And we can see like a very controlled mini version of this uh, launched by Amazon. Um, so Amazon have launched has launched uh, Amazon Go, where you can simply go into a shop and you can buy any stuff and just get out uh, without. Uh, so it you actually have to link your Amazon account to your card. Uh, but the, but then uh, while checking out, your balance gets automatically deducted from your uh, Amazon account. So that's what Amazon Go has done. There have been some problems related to that, but that's like a first step towards like a future uh, modern retail store, which we can imagine. And even apart from that, some of the functionalities uh, like RFID tags or let's say NFC payment uh, systems, they still uh, they have been deployed in uh, markets and grocery stores because those are some some of the low hanging fruits which, which you can easily target. So you don't need to pay cash or you don't even need like a card thing to swipe in. Uh, you can only like you can simply tap in a card and just leave from the store. Uh, so to ease some of the payment uh, methodologies, uh, there have been sensors deployed right now. Um, so having uh, in, having been in, introduced to the world of IoT and the ample use cases we have in this domain, uh, I'll talk more about the devices which sort of enable these uh, IoT systems. So uh, we can sort of categorize these devices into three parts. And we it can be sort of analogous to how a human functions as well. So uh, the first part is uh, a sensor. So uh, in, in any IoT system, you need a sensor to sense the physical characteristics of the environment, of the physical space it is residing in. Um, so you can think of it uh, like the tongue or the touch or the vision of any human. So all our sensory organs of a human. The second part uh, is that we need a microcontroller to control uh, and to process the information we are obtaining from the sensors. So the microcontrollers in any IoT system are like the brains of a, uh, are like the brains which decide what we should do with the data uh, coming from the sensors. And the third uh, kind of devices which we often see in such systems are actuators which are uh, basically uh, what which basically do the actions uh, commanded by the microcontrollers itself so it uh, to be analogous with the uh, human anatomical analogy you can think of it as our hands or legs or our reflexes so let's say you're touching a hot cup of coffee your fingers is sort of the sensor it senses it and then um, the microcontroller of your body processes that, okay, this thing is hot. And then you just move your hand away from it. So that's like the action. And that was uh, commanded by your brain, which is your microcontroller to your hand, which is the actuator. And that's how the whole end-to-end -end process works. And that is sort of similar to how IoT systems work as well. <clears throat> So starting off with uh, some of the basic sensors which we use in IoT, there are like lots and lots of sensors. And if you, uh, at this point in time, Google IoT sensors, you'll definitely find like hundreds and thousands of them, uh, which sort of capture different physical characteristics of the environment. Um, so uh, this is one of, uh, this is from one of the research papers where they characterize the different kinds of sensors uh, found in uh, the IoT, uh, the IoT ecosystem. So you can see that uh, we have like different sensors to capture sound, to capture flow of water, to capture the chemical properties of the environment, uh, like an AQI sensor uh, or an air quality index sensor. Then there is a GPS or indoor localization sensors. We have accelerometer, uh, gyroscope sensors. And this list goes on and on. Um, we also have temperature sensors which can control the HVAC system. So these are some of the sensors and you can look up to uh, 
uh, look up uh, on Google and check out like lots of sensors and uh, that's like uh, uh, readily available on Google. Then uh, there are some of these famous microcontrollers, um, which is like, if you want to get started with IoT, then you can simply buy a small Raspberry Pi, which is like 35 bucks. Uh, or you can uh, buy an Arduino Uno or even an ESP32. So these are like uh, on-chip uh, development boards, which you can use to uh, gather information from these sensors. And uh, they are they sort of work uh, as a mini computer and you can program any small logic in, into it and they will carry out that logic uh, by working on the sensor data they, uh, they get. And the third part uh, are the actuators. So once we have the data coming in from the sensors and once they go into uh, any microcontroller, then we can, the microcontroller can take a decision as to what we need to do uh, with that sensor data. So sen the actuators can be sort of characterized into uh, different broad categories, uh, three of them which I've shown here. So one is a hydraulic actuator, uh, which basically uh, works on the principle of uh, fluid, uh, fluid mechanics, where you have uh, where you have some system or a piston which is uh, controlled by a microcontroller and it sort of decides what the position of uh, the of the whole system should be so that uh, a specific action is carried out and there can be like different actuators which work on different physical principles i'm not a physics guy so i, I don't have like much idea into the physics um, behind these devices uh, but I know what I know is that uh, how the uh, how these devices talk with each other. So as you can see, uh, IoT has has like uh, a lot of different devices, and this is sort of a very heterogeneous space where you don't have like a single uh, standardized system defined yet. There have been some standards as to what these devices should be, what the regulation should be. But overall, as you can see, the, the whole community is pretty heterogeneous. And you need like uh, strong protocols uh, to ensure that these devices are able to talk with each other. So by heterogeneous, what I mean is that, uh, let's say you're buying uh, an IoT device from a company A, let's say, and you want to connect it to your Amazon Alexa at your home. So these two devices are sort of uh, manufactured by two different companies and uh, you really need some standardized, uh, a, a standardized way to ensure that the smart plug you're buying for from company A is sort of compatible with uh, Alexa, let's say. And to enable that, uh, we dive into the protocols uh, used in such IoT systems. And that is sort of the uh, main talking point uh, of today as well. Um, yeah, so before we get into like the protocol specific to IoT, I'll just sort of give uh, some primer about what protocols are in general and how they sort of work in computer networks. So computers within a network, let's say you have a device, you have your laptops at your home connected to a central router. Uh, they may use vastly different uh, software and hardware as well. So to provide you a simple example, you have your laptop as well as uh, your phone connected to your uh, local home router. And these are like completely different devices with different computational cap capabilities and different uh, memory requirements. Uh, and still they are able to talk with each other with complete ease. Uh, and that's because of the protocols of the internet. So what I mean by a protocol is that uh, a protocol is basically a set of rules for formatting and processing data and how they are sort of exchanged with each other. Um, and the use of protocols sort of uh, enable uh, devices to communicate with each other uh, uh, regardless of their uh, of their manufacturer or how they are made or what their type is. 
And on the right hand side, you can sort of see uh, how the internet is structured uh, uh, or modeled uh, by the community. So before we dive into the protocols of the Internet of Things, I think it's uh, important that we see how the protocols uh, of the internet work itself. So uh, a lot of these uh, protocols have been uh, researched upon and have been come up uh, by some really, really smart people uh, to ensure that there is reliable transmission between two devices. Uh, there is high throughput, uh, you, you achieve fast data speeds and all those factors. And uh, it can easily be split into like different layers. So uh, there is a physical layer using which you can uh, transmit raw bit streams over the physical medium. But then uh, having the knowledge of the physical layer is not sufficient because then you need uh, to understand how the, the format of the bit stream is. So that's what data link layer does. Then there is a, a network layer which decides uh, what path that a particular packet should take in a network. Um, and then there are like different layers such as transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, application layer. So to, to give you some simple examples of the protocols working at different layers, uh, the LAN cables which we used uh, is one of, uh, is uh, it comes under the physical layer and ethernet so we talk about ethernet cables and LAN cables, but ethernet is uh, essentially a physical layer protocol, which enables peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication between uh, two nodes in a network, um, which are connected via LAN cable. Um, and then there is, uh, you can communicate, uh, two devices can communicate with each other using uh, wireless media as well. So Wi-Fi is again a physical uh, layer protocol um which uh, by which you can uh, sort of c communicate uh, two devices wirelessly and uh, the ip addresses which we always hear about like okay the ip address of my laptop is xyz or something like that so ip is essentially a network layer protocol because it technically decides which physical path the data will take and uh, you can think of your IP addresses as uh, the home addresses of your machines uh, as to where they're residing in this uh, virtual space of uh, interconnected devices. And if a packet uh, or, or some form of data wants to get communicated from one single point to another single point, we need to have, know the end-to-end -end IP addresses of the whole uh, system. So before I uh, go any further, are there any uh, questions from Mayur or anyone? Uh, because I, I can go on and on. Uh, let me yeah. check. I think yeah. uh, you covered uh, the part very well and it was quite uh, straightforward. I think you mentioned yeah. about BLE, but uh, it might be good uh, to mention like the full form of BLE in one oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll be getting to that. I just wanted to make sure that uh, it's not like monotonous and everyone is not zoning out because I'm totally zoning out right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure that okay, everything is fine, or am I not? Uh, I'm not disconnected from you. No, no Anik, you're oh, doing awesome job. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure that it is as general as possible. So you can just stop me at any point in time if you think that it is like going over your head or something, because I want to make sure that uh, all the content is sort of uh, understood by the general audience, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so having this primer on protocols, we we'll, uh, simply dive into one of the protocols which we have, which we see in uh, real life. I'll just touch upon it uh, briefly. So one of the protocols which we all are familiar with is uh, Wi-Fi, um, and Wi-Fi essentially works on the last two layers, the data link layer and the physical layer, and uh, the technical name of Wi-Fi at your home or uh, at any point. Uh, so all these protocols are essentially developed by a central community 
uh, which is the IEEE community. Uh, and they sort of uh, they sort of define a set of rules about how uh, two devices which are connected wirelessly over Wi-Fi should communicate with each other. Um, so uh, how Wi-Fi works is that you they, you basically shoot uh, light rays uh, between each other at uh, 2.5 gigahertz frequency of light or 5 gigahertz frequency of light. And that's the way you communicate uh, between you, you achieve communication between two devices. And the sort of sophisticated uh, name of Wi-Fi set by the community is 82.11n. So there have been like different versions of Wi-Fi. Uh, there has been 82.11a hyphen C. There have been like lots and lots of versions. And in each version, they make some improvements to the protocol. Uh, so that you achieve uh, faster uh, throughput of data. So you are able to achieve fast speed between uh, two endpoints. You are able to uh, send data reliably between two endpoints. And that's uh, sort of the standard setup uh, by the IEEE. And all your routers at your home, or any modern routers, they sort of come and build with these protocols. So uh, they sort of know that, OK, I'll be operating uh, based on this protocol. And for the common people like us, uh, we simply refer to this as Wi-Fi. We don't refer to this as IEEE 802.11. Uh, although if you are in computer networks, then you should ideally refer to it as uh, you refer to it by that specific protocol name. And uh, how this works is that uh, there is a small 100 megahertz band, as you can see in here, uh, of light, which is sort of reserved uh, for Wi-Fi communication. So just a, a small digression, digression from my usual flow. Um, the whole spectrum of light which we have uh, can be chunked into like different frequencies. So light travels at uh, the speed of light, obviously. Uh, but we have like different frequencies and different wavelengths of light uh, at which uh, at which light can travel. And each of these frequencies are sort of regulated by a centralized authority. So uh, we basically cannot transmit uh, any information apart from this uh, tiny 100 megahertz band, because then it will be sort of illegal. Uh, because there are different frequencies uh, which over which uh, the military communicates, uh, which are sort of confidential, uh, then there, are, there is some uh, frequency uh, sort of uh, separated out to uh, basically communicate uh, TV transmissions. So we shouldn't uh, use that frequency as well. So we basically have a very narrow frequency band uh, over which we can uh, transmit information. and. 2.5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz is sort of the ideal band uh, provided to the IEEE community over which they can develop all sorts of protocols. And you might think that why the specific uh, band of 2.5 and 5 gigahertz? So one of the reasons boils down to uh, the physical properties of light. So depending on the uh, frequency or the wavelength of light, we uh, we have a specific amount of attenuation or uh, the power with which we can like sort of uh, throw or propel this light into space. So if we have like a very low frequency, uh, then we are in the region region of uh, radio waves, and as we all know, radio waves can travel kilometers and kilometers uh, uninterrupted. Uh, so that's uh, in the regime of uh, sort of very few uh, very few hertz uh, where we can achieve radio communication. Uh, as you start increasing the frequency from hertz, megahertz, uh, gigahertz to even more frequency, then we sort of enter into the zone of uh, gamma rays and X rays, which are sort of harmful to your body uh, upon constant exposure. So uh, these light waves have since the frequency is very high, they have very short uh, wavelengths, and they are sort of very penetrative as well. And to 
uh, let's say, make them travel X amount of distance, you need uh, a higher amount of energy uh, as compared to transmitting uh, a light wave at a uh, radio frequency, the same amount of X distance. Uh, that's because energy is sort of proportional to uh, frequency. And since we are transmitting a high frequency beam uh, of lots of uh, uh, with high frequency, it will take uh, a lot amount of power to do achieve that. And uh, this uh, 2.4 gigahertz or the 2.5 gigahertz band is really sort of the sweet spot at which we can operate, where it is not that harmful to the human body. Uh, it is not that penetrative, uh, and we need we don't need that much amount of power to uh, sort of uh, transmit uh, light beams so that we can have. Uh, connectivity in a small radius of a uh, region. And it is uh, not too low that you can just uh, propel it uh, over kilometers and kilometers. Um, so you can modify the wireless uh, Wi-Fi protocol to have like uh, a lower uh, frequency and people are always sort of experiment with that. But then uh, there is a downfall to that, that even though you can achieve communication over a longer distance, uh, the speed or the network speed or the throughput which we talk about, that will be pretty low. So you won't have like uh, Mbps or Gbps, but you may ha have like a uh, Kbps uh, speed coming in. So that's uh, a bit digression, digression from my normal flow, just to give you guys some background about wireless protocols and why we are just focusing on this 2.5 gigahertz band and not why we are not talking about transmitting information using X-rays or radio waves or even TV white spaces. Um, so yeah, that's that's the whole picture right here. Uh, I hope there it's it's sort of all uh, clear and I haven't uh, zoned everyone out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, how, uh, coming back to Wi-Fi, this 100 megahertz uh, band of frequency is sort of chunked into different uh, channels, which are 22 megahertz wide. So uh, the actual information is transmitted uh, in this particular 20 megahertz uh, band, and the two megahertz on the side are uh, sort of uh, like guard channels so that if there is any information overflow into that, those frequencies, uh, we don't. It doesn't interrupt the transmission in other uh, in other bands, and uh, we refer to these numbers. These numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, all these numbers are referred to as uh, channels. So that's like a, a small technical jargon for us. And information is uh, transmitted through different channels. Um, and let's say you are sitting at your home right now and you're communicating with your local router. So definitely that router must be using uh, 82.11n or some sort of mixed uh, B slash G protocol. Uh, but what it does is that uh, the router has uh, specifically selected a channel on which uh, information will be communicated between your device uh, and that uh, local router. Uh, so that's that's uh, that channel is decided based on the amount of uh, throughput we have, and all this decision is made by the router itself. So just a summary from this slide: Wi-Fi works on 2.5 gigahertz. It is chunked into different channels, and we communicate information by picking one channel and transmitting over it. Um, so moving on. Uh, we'll talk about the Bluetooth uh, low energy protocol or the BLE protocol. And again, the fancy name or the standard name for uh, Bluetooth is IEEE 802.15.1. So that's the, uh, that's the name of the Bluetooth protocol. And BLE protocol is sort of a modification of the original Bluetooth protocol to do some interesting IoT stuff. Um, and again, um, it operates at uh, 2.5 gigahertz frequency. Um, so you can see the frequency chunked into uh, not 22 megahertz, which was like a wide uh, channel which we had here, but it's uh, chunked into two megahertz uh, slices. And again, we have like different uh, channel names going on. So we have zero, one, two, I think we overall have 40 channels. 
so 39 is the biggest number and we're starting with zero because computer science and um, there have there are specific advertising channels um, via which you can communicate uh, information uh, between two devices and all this is based on uh, the bluetooth protocol um, any any questions so far yeah i was just thinking uh, what are some factors uh, one should take uh, take into consideration to decide whether they should communicate over wifi or bluetooth yeah that's a that's a good question so um whenever a manufacturer uh, manufactures a device an iot device they sort of know the use case of that device or uh, like in which scenarios that device will be used and uh, if you want to uh, if you want to have communication between a very short range like a few meters then we we are fine with either bluetooth or uh, wifi uh, but if we want like uh, communication in like tens of meters then maybe we should go on with wifi as well and there are some uh, there are lots of considerations as well in choosing what protocol a device should operate on so one of the primary factors is power because um, these iot devices will be connected will be placed in some corner or some, or in some or at some place where there will be no constant power source um, and that's why these protocols uh, become more and more important because ble can operate on very low power uh, and wifi needs like constant power because you want to shoot uh, light beams at a at a farther length as compared to bluetooth so that will require like lots of power and that's why uh, our router is sort of properly powered using uh, the 20 volt uh, adapter we have or whatever volts those are um, so power is one of the main considerations then we focus on uh, the data transmission rate which we want to have so if we don't care about high speed data transmission then we are fine with bluetooth but if you want to like dump in lots of data then we need wifi in that case so that's another kind con uh, consideration the third consideration is uh, the distance at which we want to communicate the data so if you want to communicate data at a larger distance then we need uh, bluetooth but sorry uh, we, then we need wifi but if it, but if it's just in a short vicinity then we are fine with uh, bluetooth as well so it depends on power it depends on um, it depends on uh, i forgot it depends on power it depends on the data throughput required and it also depends on the distance uh, distance at which we want to achieve communication mm -hmm. we have one question from sujay uh, mm -hmm. why does wifi have a wide slicing of channels of 22 versus bluetooth of 2 yeah yeah that's that's a good question um so uh you can think of it as uh so the more amount of channels uh so the wider channel you have the more amount of uh, information you can pump in so you can uh think of the these bands or these channels as uh as as a pipe so the wider the pipe the more information per second you can pass uh through that pipe and also um you it's like uh, if you have two devices and they are only going to communicate on only one particular channel, uh, it's not like they'll uh, communicate on two channels. Um, but if they're only going to communicate on one particular channel, then uh, you need sort of uh, a, a bigger pipe to achieve higher data throughput. And that's one of the reasons why Wi-Fi has higher throughput uh, compared to BLE, because you can think of BLE as having shorter pipes of two megahertz uh but uh here we have like a bigger uh pipe with with uh which has like a capacity of 22 megahertz um so that's like the simplest answer i can give you to think of these uh bands as pipes uh but to get into more technicality it's much more complex than that because uh newer and newer wi-fi protocols used use channel bonding <laughs> where you sort of merge these two channels to transmit your data. So there are some modifications to uh, that protocol. And then uh, we also have like MIMO where you can have like, 
where you can communicate through multiple channels uh, synchronously. You pick different channels and you transmit data. Uh, but that's like uh, the whole point of doing that is to increase the width of your pipe. Uh, so that's a good question. Yeah. I think we can move on to. Yeah, sure. Um, so the next protocol uh, which IoT devices uh, usually use is uh, the Zigbee protocol. And it is uh, sort of uh, answers, it, it sort of adds to your questions which you asked me. Uh, so it is a global standard to address the unique needs for <clears throat> low cost and low power wireless IoT networks. So uh, Wi-Fi, which I talked about, it actually, uh, it was not made for IoT devices, but it was used for wireless communication between our laptops and smartphones and stuff like that. So we cannot use this protocol directly to achieve communication between two devices, uh, two IoT devices. So that's the reason um, Zigbee and BLE were developed so that we can achieve such uh, uh, low power transmissions. And um, the technical name again is 802.15.4. Uh, that's the standard on which it operates. And just going back to this uh, model, this OSI model uh, on which the, in the whole internet is based upon, we can uh, see that this the stack here is sort of similar uh, and sort of shrunk for Zigbee. So we have like the physical layer over which we transmit the data. Then there is a medium access control layer. So a Mac layer basically defines which layer has act, which device has access uh, to the physical layer at any point in time. So if we have like three devices, uh, all three of them cannot uh, transmit data at the same time. Uh, because then it will lead to interference, collisions, and all sort of stuff, all sort of bad things. So we usually have a, a medium access control protocol, which basically uh, which basically dictates how each device uh, gets access to that physical medium, uh, which is air in our case. Uh, and there are like different uh, layers on top of it, so network layer, application layer, so that um, we achieve end-to-end uh, -end low power, low cost communication between these devices. Um, so that's uh, Zigbee for you. And again, it operates at uh, 2.5 gigahertz uh, yeah, frequency. Um, so moving on, uh, there are like different protocols uh, and this list goes on and on. So there is NFC, there's Z-Wave, there's LoRaWAN, and there are numerous, uh, numerous protocols um, which are there. And one of the most interesting protocols is the backscatter protocol, which I just wanted to share with everyone because it's really super cool. Uh, so it's like a, it's a protocol which uh, transforms existing wireless signals. Oh, can you hear the audio? I, I guess you, you can't. No, no. Uh, no, but yeah, I guess it, we can just uh, watch it here. So I guess all, all of you can see the captions and just <laughs> read what is happening. So basically what we have here is that there are these two devices uh, on which we want to achieve communication. And here they're just demonstrating that despite any battery, uh, if we swipe something on the left device, there is some communication on the right device. So these devices are uh, completely powerless. They don't use any existing signals of their own. I think, yeah, I can just hide the captions. You can, you can see what is happening here. So let's say there are signals coming from a TV tower between Alice and Bob's. Both of them first absorb the TV signals. Um, and they, uh, they have like these, uh, they have, they're made out of uh, some, I, I believe uh, some pizza electric materials where uh, if you apply any pressure or any sort of uh, stuff like that, you, you're able to transmit and like, convert the existing signals for your own uh, communication. So here they're showing uh, a demonstration where uh, they're making a transaction between these two devices using uh, backscatter. So the name backscatter essentially means that you're scattering the existing wireless signals to firstly power yourself 
and to secondly achieve communication with another device which speaks back scatter and it uh, so if they are using existing signal like doesn't that signal already has some data oh yeah that's that's a good question yeah yeah um yeah i'm not sure how how exactly this works and even i had that same question uh but they really they sort of reuse or uh, and recycle that information so i believe uh, how they must be doing is that they must be preserving the existing information uh, piggybacking the their own data on on the data which is being transmitted uh, and then once it is received you sort of remove that data so i think it it depends on the fundamentals of piggybacking your own data on an existing packet but yeah that's a, that's a really good question uh, and i am really not sure about the answer because uh, it involves like a lot of ec stuff going on in there no problem yeah it, i i just yeah. thought about uh, we, <laughs> we have one question from sujay like what bandwidth does backscatter work with oh um yeah i think uh, i haven't uh, i don't know the uh, deep details of this protocol um because it's like a very different protocol uh, from what we have seen before because um it it there is no uh, power source so there's no format uh, in which we can uh, there's no standard format in which we can exchange our packets it all depends on the existing wireless signal so if you take this these two devices in in space then they won't be able to communicate with each other because there is there are no existing signals but i can imagine that uh, since they're working on the frequencies used by tv towers which is usually uh, in the range of 600 megahertz to 700 megahertz so i believe they operate on that particular frequency uh, but coming to the bandwidth i think these the, the, the this protocol is only for uh doing communication in a very short range of time uh and doing it wirelessly uh, of course um and the i think the data requirements uh the the amount of data uh, communicated between two nodes will be very less in this case because we are just uh, using the existing uh, light sources yeah i think it's quite like it's good that you share this because uh, it's pretty yeah. new research and look it's very sustainable yeah yeah it is yeah yeah considering sustainability i think yeah it's it's a very cool thing to explore um yeah let me fix this again okay uh yeah even before we uh dive into the future stuff uh i have a question for you guys uh so sorry for putting you guys on spot but it's like it's fine even if you don't get the answer um so i have talked about these protocols and i've constantly highlighted the fact that they operate on 2.5 gigahertz and you must have seen it uh, every time uh 2.5 2.5 2.5 and um having studied uh physics in like 11th and 12th grade we know that there is something called as uh interference between waves so what do you guys think about uh this like maybe like why even though they are working at the same frequency why are they why is there no interference between their communication or is there an interference between the communication which i have just skipped conveniently because no one has any knowledge about it apart from me oh so, like uh, i have a very, I have very little knowledge but yeah so the question is uh, even if they are operating at same frequency why it's not interfering with other mm -hmm. because they are operating in in that same neighborhood right so uh they uh if we have like a wifi device in there and we also have a bluetooth uh device in there then there should be some sort of interference right? so if two people are talking two devices are talking bluetooth and if two devices are talking wifi then shouldn't there be any cross uh cross interference between both of them yeah and i think like i i have similar thought and even like sujay suggested mm -hmm. uh, his uh, his answer is uh, maybe there is encrypt encryption involved and it verifies it like there is some header of sorts that 
then followed by the data packet hmm. yeah that's a that's a uh, good uh, that's a good thought process so um yes there is encryption encryption um or there is some checksumming taking place between packets to ensure that they are not corrupted in any form so you can detect uh, cross interference if there is any between the between the communication and exactly as uh, sujay's intuition uh, point out that uh, there are some checksums in the header to make sure that the data is not corrupted so if there is any interference uh we will be able to catch that interference and the packet will be resent between the two devices because the whole information was not communicated uh but um uh will there be any interference in the first place if two devices are communicating so this is more like a physics question than like a cs question or or even like a, a protocols question um so you can you can think in terms of like different dimensions uh you can think of it in the in terms of power in terms of uh in terms of channels or stuff like that yeah you can take any guesses it's fine i think right. like I, yeah go on uh <laughs> i was thinking like uh i think both devices should like agree upon each other like it's like every every like even the tower is throwing signals even the de device is looking to capture signal but someone should like approve at point that okay just mm -hmm. read this not ignore other signals or don't mm -hmm. yeah that's that's an interesting line of thought um yeah that's that's a that's a good line of thought and uh the you are sort of describing uh the media access control protocols in wifi where two devices decide upon okay i'm transmitting you don't transmit so there is uh something uh which goes on in the background where each device tells the other device okay don't transmit i'll be transmitting right now and if the other device is sort of hearing some transmission from other device uh then it doesn't transmit itself so that's an interesting line of thought as well and i really like that like you you are catching up really quickly um but uh to to get more into the physics of the question um so that's uh, obviously one of the answers why interference don't happen because if a device hears that there is some interference going on or, or there is some shady transmission going on it doesn't transmit in the first place itself uh but uh to get more into the physics of the question we we saw that uh bale it operates on like narrow channels and wifi operates on wide channels <clears throat> so uh the interference which we will have between a wifi and a bluetooth communication uh will be a narrow narrow band interference which is sort of negligible uh in most cases so uh, a bluetooth communication won't interfere between a wifi communication um because uh, firstly the band will be very narrow uh, and secondly uh, as you can recall uh, bluetooth operates at uh, at a very lower power so usually the signal strength uh, of any packet or any signal is measured in uh, decibels so to uh, truly achieve um, interference even from that small narrow band of ble transmission uh you need at least uh, 10 decibels of interference um bit, uh to to basically cause some problems but since ble is sort of transmitted in a very narrow band and at a very uh, low frequency at a, at a very low power there is not much interference with any existing wifi communication between two devices because that interference is sort of very very negligible uh so that's that's one of the answers now you might think what happens if we sort of reverse the case will a wifi communication interfere with the bluetooth with the, with any bluetooth communication uh because the other way around we know that bluetooth uh has is sort of weak to uh, to make problems in wifi uh but let's say if we have a wifi communication uh going on and now bale wants to transmit its own data um so what bluetooth does is that it uh, implements frequency hopping so 
what it does is that if it detects that okay this frequency is not working upon transmission then it quickly hops to another frequency and um, sort of transmits it uh, on another frequency to achieve data transmission so uh, bluetooth uh, usually adopts frequency hopping so that it can avoid such interference issues so those uh, those are the two factors which ensure that uh, there is no interference between any communication and similarly zigbee also adopts uh, sim similar concepts to make sure there is no interference between any of these communications even though all of them are operating at uh, 2.5 gigahertz yeah we have we have a question from sujay what about interference between two different wifi communication or two separate channel yeah that's uh, that's that's a great question again so if if there is uh, so wifi usually adopts uh, so this is all handled at the media access control level or the mac level so that's like the second layer above the physical layer and there are protocols where uh, where to before send, before making any transmission uh, the two devices uh, let's say there are two devices which we want to communicate to each other and there is a third device so the sender first uh, sends like a pro pro packet uh, which says that hey i'm going to send a message and just don't interfere with my communication for time t let's say uh, which can be 10 seconds so that packet is sent first and since we are sending light waves and if you're using like omnidirectional antennas this light wave travels like uh, in the whole uh, sphere and any devices which uh, are in the vicinity of that uh, sender receives uh, that message and they get alerted that okay i should not be sending anything uh, for like 10 seconds and then uh, the transmission is made and there's another packet which is sent out by the sender that hey i'm done with the communication uh, i sort of overestimated the 10 seconds uh, i i did it in 5 seconds or, or or something of that sort so you sort of silence other devices by sending out packets uh, through packets and that's how usually everything works in uh, uh, in in wifi so i've given like a very simplified description of the of the solution this is not the whole solution of course there are there are like edge cases and people have tried lots of uh, lots and lots of things to solve those cases there are like these hidden node problems if you take like a proper wireless course um uh, but yeah this is like a very simplistic answer uh, to your question and that's a, that's a good question thanks for it yeah all right um okay so moving on um so what, since we have seen um like we have touched upon like uh, lots of protocols so far i'll talk more about um uh, a, a key technology which enables uh, which enables some intelligent things which we can do uh, in iot uh, and that is sort of enabled by beacons so beacons are small packets transmitted by wireless devices um and you must be wondering why they are used so they are used for synchronizing data transmission uh so as you all might know we are actually dealing with like wireless space uh in this scenario in the case of wire in, in the case of a lan cable or an ethernet cable there is like instant communication and uh we can talk to each other almost uh instantly with each other and you can sort of synchronize uh the transmission by constantly uh sending out pulse uh, like poll uh, polling messages to each other but in the case of uh, wireless we need sort of these beacons to make sure that okay i'm oscillating at this frequency and i'm oscillating at that frequency so that's like a very simplistic uh use case of beacons and another use case of beacons is for device discovery so uh just to give you guys a simple example uh, about device discovery uh let's say you have your phone and you have turned on your wifi button on your phone uh so there are two ways with which uh, any ssid or any uh, router can appear on your device so the one way uh, one of the ways is uh, active scanning so in active scanning what you are uh, what you do is that whenever you whenever you turn on your smartphone and press the wifi button it starts sending uh, beacons in all directions uh, saying hey i am alive hey i am alive just uh, give me some internet and um once a router listens to one of these beacons it send it acknowledges back 
that hey i listen to you and this is sort of my information this is sort of my uh st- signal strength and that's why the router pops up on your list and you can see that okay this is a particular signal strength and this is active scanning we are talking about the second way of device discovery is uh passive scanning where once you turn on the wifi button uh the routers are the ones who sort of uh keep on publishing messages that hey i am alive uh, i i can provide you internet or something of that sort and then once a device receives any beacon from any router then uh, you can uh, then it pops up on your router list and you can basically click that uh, router and sort of connect with that uh, specific router and start communication um and when these beacons are sent it depends on the power consumption constraint so maybe in the case of smartphones you you would prefer more sort of a passive scanning because active scanning requires sending packets and sending packets means that you want to pump in lots of power to send those packets so since the router is already powered um you usually would prefer passive scanning but then there are like sort of trade offs where uh, if there is if all the routers are doing passive scanning then your phone will take some time to basically detect any existing router in the place because it is waiting for some time to receive the beacon so it all depends on like different trade offs on different uh, considerations but usually the beacons uh, are sent in the order of seconds or even milliseconds and now um, these beacons can be actually used for localizing customers uh, or it can be used for different different uh applic use cases so coming back to retail iot um we can uh think of uh, having an iot device which is placed in uh, one of the aisles let's say which is uh selling some sort of clothes for some reason and uh the retail uh, as you can see in this workflow here the retail beacon can send a unique signal and let's say the uh the owner of the shop just tells you that okay if you turn on your bluetooth then you will receive some cool discounts we have for you today so you have that app and bluetooth uh, enabled on your phone and then you can pick up such signals from these beacons and then uh once the uh once you receive that beacon you you will get uh pushed a notification or even a targeted personalized message uh just for you so that uh you are sort of pushed into the incentive to buy more uh stuff from that particular shop so that's one of the use cases of beacon where one of the simple use cases is localizing any person in in the physical space um then we can also market via push notifications as we can see here so whenever you go into that shop and if you are if you have the app of the shop and the bluetooth is enabled then you can easily get uh, push notifications as well as targeted advertisements from uh, the owner of the shop as well so that's like a really powerful uh, technology um which uh, which is seen in iot devices um so yeah i think uh, maybe i should like uh, jump on i'll sort of disrupt the order of uh, of my explanation uh, and sort of dive into like some of the code coding part or like some stuff which i did um uh, before just so that um there's not just me talking a lot of things and i can sort of jump uh, to one of the school project which i did uh during the last uh during my last uh semester in iit um so this uh so this um uh, this project was basically uh based on localizing uh localizing uh devices using wifi uh and you can check this github page out so just to give you all some context about it um we know that modern gps systems have sort of an error margin of 3 meters uh outdoors but these guys fail miserably when we want to localize devices indoors so uh to achieve indoor localization we can use existing wifi signals uh to sort of localize what is happening in the internal environment so uh here you can see that um uh, there is 
this router, which is in our local network. And this is our whole setup. We had sort of three ESP32 devices, uh, each of whom are like uh, sniffing packets in the network itself. And then uh, all of these devices communicate their information to uh, one of the backends. And uh, the backend sort of processes all that information to predict where this target device is in the physical space itself. So just to give you a, a simple demonstration, we did this uh, in one of the labs in IIT Bombay. We had three ESP32 devices. We had a, a host laptop, which collects information from all these three devices. And then we tried to uh, sort of localize these uh, mobile phone devices using uh, by sniffing uh, their communication packets. So one of the uh, first thing before appro uh, for approaching this problem is to build a path loss model where we basically map that, okay, if this is a particular value of signal strength, then the object should be at this particular distance. So it uh, the distance basic, the RSSI or the received signal strength value essentially decays exponentially with distance uh to the power of four and we did some experiments to estimate the path loss model and then we did uh, uh we ran a localization algorithm to predict where that particular device is so uh let's say if this is the scenario where um where these are the three devices and this is a target device uh each of these devices uh measure the rssi value of of uh, packets coming from this particular device. Uh, so this guy remembers the RSSI, this guy remembers the RSSI, and even this guy remembers the RSSI. And uh, since we know that, know this sort of mapping that for this particular RSSI, uh, this should be the particular distance of uh, the device via which we are uh, obtaining the signal. We basically draw the radius of that uh, of that uh, of that distance, and then the intersection point of all these three devices is the actual target uh, is, is the actual position of the device. So since we know that uh, two circles intersect in two at two points, and three circles may intersect in three points, uh, we usually need three uh, three devices to sort of triangulate that signal uh, to achieve localization. And we achieved uh, a look an accuracy of two meters using our localization method. So diving into the coding part of it, uh, I won't bore you with my talk and provide some action. So uh, this is the code which runs on the ESP32 device. So basically how it works is that, first of all, you need to uh, initialize so this is the main function which runs on all these uh, ESP32 devices. So what they do is that uh, they firstly initialize uh, the initialize connect to a router basically with the specific uh, password and they connect to this particular router. Then what we then do is that uh, we initialize some variables and we then communicate uh, with each other uh, using MQTT. So that's another protocol which I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. So how this is done is that um, we sniff some packets uh, out. So while initializing the sniffer and uh, the variables in Wi-Fi, we set this callback, uh, which, which, which is triggered whenever a new packet is detected or sniffed. Then we uh, sort of filter out, filter in all the useful packets. So uh, we obtain the source MAC address of, uh, of the packet itself. And uh, once we understand what the source MAC is, we sort of store the RSSI value and some additional information like the channel on which it was sent. And we communicate this information uh, to the backend laptop uh, using this function, which is MQTT publish. So MQTT is one protocol which I'll get to in, in a few moments. 
but this is how the message is provided. So uh, each ESP32 device uh, provides the MAC address of the device it has sniffed, the RSSI value of the packet, and it also sends in uh, the channel on, on which it was sniffed. And all this information is connect uh, is collected in the backend. So if we go here. And let me just open it up. Yep. So all this uh, information is um, obtained in this RSSI callback, which we registered. And we obtained the MAC and the RSSI value, uh, which were like published here by the deep devices. And uh, since there was a lot of communication going on in that particular room itself, we filtered <coughs> some of the devices and we uh, like pinned them down to these two devices, which were uh, the devices of, which were my device and uh, the smartphone of my partner as well. And uh, we put this in a, a queue, we op just obtain this information and just populate the queue. And here there is this thread, which always keeps on running, which uh, basically obtains the RSSI data and computes the uh, distance based on the model. So here, what we do is that, what I do is that uh, in every loop, <clears throat> oh yeah, th is there any question? No, no, no. Uh, I I was gonna ask uh, once you're done with this, like it, mm -hmm. uh, it might be good if you can <clears throat> elaborate on uh, like what is MQQT and like the subscriber model like compared to other oh, ways. Yeah, I guess I, I should just revisit back. Uh, yeah, because uh, it would be like very difficult to understand MQTT before, yeah, to understand the whole stuff. So let me present back here. <clears throat> so since we talked about beacons um, and how they're used uh, in the IoT system, we then now move on to uh, to understand some of the paradigms uh, uh, and, and behind how these protocols are constructed. So usually uh, for any communication we do nowadays, uh, we follow this usual request response uh, paradigm to achieve any communication. So if you want to do any Google search, let's say, then you are the client here, you make a request which goes to the Google server and you obtain the response. So here the client initiates a request, then the server processes the request. And meanwhile, the client waits. So that's the key part here. And then uh, the server sends back the response uh, to the client. So if you want to search for any stuff, that's the response you get back from the server. But we cannot use this sort of architecture to communicate sensors directly to the cloud because uh, there is a need to basically have an energy efficient messaging architecture. And we also need to sort of decouple the data transfer. So the key point here is that since the client waits, it is sort of wasting that much amount of time in powering itself and sort of listening to uh, the response from the server. And like low power sensors, low cost low power sensors cannot afford to do that. Uh, so we need like a different paradigm, uh, a different set of protocols to achieve this. And that's where uh, the publish uh, subscribe paradigm uh, drops in, where we have like uh, different publishers and we have different uh, subscribers. And the publishers in this case are usually uh, a sen are, you are usually sensors who essentially uh, send their messages to a, a common broker. So this middle system is basically a broker. And uh, it basically deals uh, with handling all the messages by via buffering and sharding. And then there are subscribers who are interested um, in in the messages itself. So we uh, so these are some of the <clears throat> jargon in here. Uh, so a message is basically an array of bytes. Uh, we have a topic. Uh, on which a message gets uh, published on and on which uh, a server or any interested entity can subscribe on. <clears throat> so, uh, 
So uh, let's say if we have like different sensors, like AQI sensor, temperature sensor, then we can have different topics. Um, so AQI sensors can publish on topic AQI and um, temperature sensors can publish on topic uh, temperature. And let's say we have like an HVAC system here, then it is only interested in the temperature, let's say, then it will uh, sort of uh, only subscribe to the temperature topic and receive all the messages from temperature. But let's say if we have like an alerting system which wants to detect the air quality at your home and alert 911 if there's something wrong, then you would be interested in the AQI topic only. So that's uh, that's how the publisher subscriber paradigm works. And a broker is sort of a server or it can be a small device uh, which basically manages the data handling. So in this case, there is we have sort of decoupled the data transfer between the publishers and subscribers. So all the assurances of quality of services is provided by the broker itself. Uh, and we and the publisher does not need to wait uh, bef like before sending any message. So once it sends its own message to the broker, it can just simply rest and uh, power off again. So just to provide everyone with like a short demo of MQTT, I can um, show a very short demo of how it works. So before that, let me just rearrange my tabs. So let's uh, check uh, how whether MQTT is uh, running on my system or not. So I'll just uh, check it using this. So as you can see, um, MQTT is uh, running. So Mosquito is a message broker which sort of uh, implements MQTT. So MQTT is the name of the protocol, which is uh, message queuing telemetry transport protocol. And Mosquito is sort of a software which implements it, this protocol. And it is uh, running on my machine right now. So in this simplistic scenario, all the broker, the publisher, and the subscribe subscriber is my machine itself. Um, because I, I don't have like different machines with which I can demonstrate the communication. But uh, so this is my Mosquito service, which is running on. And just assume that this terminal is like a different device running on some different machine. So I'll basically do Mosquito sub. And let me subscribe on some topic, let's say. Let's say the topic can be temperature something of that sort. And uh, let's assume that this is another device, which is like a sensor, and it wants to publish uh, on the topic temperature. And the message it has uh, for the subscriber, for all its subscribers is the temperature is uh, 32 degree Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius. Um, so once we send that, you can see that this message has popped up because the subscriber had subscribed to the topic temperature and we can see that uh, it has received this message. Now let's say the pu publisher subscribes on some uh, different topic. So we won't be able to see this message here right now because it was uh, published on a different topic. But Let's say we are in Champagne and the temperature has changed to uh, 10 degrees Celsius, then this is the message uh, which we receive right now. So this is how uh, publisher, subscriber, or the pubs of paradigm works, where basically the broker is uh, this guy, uh, which is my laptop itself. And there will be different um, subscribers and publishers. Uh, Who's, who communicate via the message broker. Uh, so just to highlight the fact, this is a message broker. The, yeah. Uh, so, Anikir, I, I just want to clarify. So since uh, going back to the uh, analogy you gave that we have mm -hmm. sensors, we have actuator. So, yeah. and, uh, so there would be a, 
a laptop or a server which will uh, run this code but a, like how like and in the client like hvac system you will write the publisher like subscriber code and that will sit and run on it continuously but uh will you write uh, the sensor code like i'm just uh, in terms of deployment the sensor mm -hmm. is sending uh, like a topic message so you will code mm -hmm. on that part but uh, uh, on that device and so basically you need three devices one uh, where one on the sensor you are uh, publishing mm -hmm. a topic you write that code you have your laptop which is working as a broker and you have another set of code on hmm. on the like the fine uh, yeah subscriber. yes yeah so coming to the deployment uh, coming to the deployment uh, yes the sensor will publish on a particular topic and uh, usually the broker a broker can be a microcontroller device um, or it can be an edge gateway uh, which we will come to uh, at the end of the presentation and um, what happens is that uh, the sensor will keep on publishing to that particular topic. The microcontroller has subscribed to that topic and it is also the broker as well. So it can receive the messages coming in uh, from, uh, from the publisher. And depending the, on that, it can actually uh, dictate what the actuator should do. So coming back to the code here right now, in my case, <clears throat> these ESP32 devices uh, are the publishers. And uh, so when, whenever they sniff any packet, they publish a message. And uh, then we have the laptop, which is uh, a subscriber, as well as it is um, the broker as well. So we just need, like, uh, the broker can be a different entity, and uh, all three of them can be different entities. But in my case, there was no need to have like a separate subscriber and a separate broker. Um, so it, it all depends on the use cases. Uh, and usually the sensors are the publishers and uh, the actuators are essentially either the subscribers or they receive, uh, they receive instructions from someone who has the subscription. So let, uh, for example, a microcontroller. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So Sujay has a question. Does the MQTT requires a Raspberry Pi to run on? It is very similar to ROS. Um, so MQTT is like a like an application layer protocol, which uh, which is very high up in in the protocol order, and it can uh, it is it can be run on uh, any sort of operating system depending on the implementation. So uh, Mosquito is sort of uh, Mosquito is. Uh, dev, uh, there is a version, Linux version for Mosquito. There, there should be uh, a Linux version. There should be an ROS version for Mosquito as well. Um, so yeah, there, there are like different implement, implementations for MQTT which have been developed. Yeah. All right. Um, so moving on. Uh, yeah, you, as you can see here, uh, there are these different MQTT uh, event handlers, which we have. And whenever we connect uh, to an MQTT uh, to an MQTT host, we essentially um, initialize this Wi-Fi sniffer callback, which is out here. And this in this Wi-Fi sniffer callback, uh, whenever we detect a packet, we communicate this information using this publish message. And here I sort of uh, log that um, the whenever whenever an uh, event gets published, I sort of log that this was the topic and this was the data uh, on which it, this this was the data which was published. Uh, and let me see if I have the topics here. Yeah. So the topics I'm currently using is RSSI slash the particular Mac ID. So the subscriber in my case needed to know from which device I'm getting this particular message. Um, so here you can see that it is uh, subscribing. So let me see in Python when I'm subscribing to uh, the code. So here I start the connect thread, which is out here, and then it connects to the broker. And upon connection, it subscribes uh, to all the topics which start with RSSI and all the topics which uh, start with CSI. And then, um, 
we usually add a callback so callbacks are usually used for triggering any function upon uh, a receival of any message so if any if any message is received on this particular topic then we should trigger this particular callback and then we check uh, uh, from whom we have received this message and from whom we have and what is the rss value uh, that was received and once we do that we trigger this localization function which sort of minimizes uh, the loss so basically it's uh, it's like we want to uh, let's say ease the distance estimated for a particular device mac address then the loss function we define is basically the distance between the actual anchors and the device e and the predicted rssi uh, value the and the predicted distance from the rssi model so if you see here the rssi model is simply uh, since we just have this uh, uh, math out here since rssi is uh, related to distance like this we have uh, we can calculate the distance by doing the inverse operation and you can see the constants here so we developed some different models and <clears throat> these were the model this was the model which worked for us um yeah and that's that's uh, that's how the end to end localization was done in our case and we achieved like <clears throat> a localization accuracy of uh, 2 meters in this case and this github page uh, basically describes all the implementation details as well all right um so once we have seen um once that we have seen localization using wifi uh and this was my last summer project last semester project at iit bombay um i also had another project where i was uh doing localization using ble uh and this was my uh sophomore year intern project uh here at uic um and this was a paper we published in the in one of the mobicoms conferences and the basic idea behind uh this is similar to what we have uh what we have in uh localization using wifi so in this case uh i can describe the setup first so what we did in this case was that uh so the motivation for this problem is to basically localize customers uh in a retail store so that you can sort of once you localize them uh you can sort of profile them for their behavior like where they're visiting at which point they're stopping in the store and you can sort of provide targeted advertisements push notifications to sort of maximize uh the profit of your store and um what experiments uh but so to enable that we need accurate indoor localization and one of the methods we explored in this paper was that we placed a uh, bluetooth beacons at specific intervals so i did this experiment in granger library itself uh, where the books sort of bookshelves sort of serve as uh, the aisles and i placed like different beacons out here and uh, we had like different stop locations where i had a packet sniffer which sniffed packets uh, bluetooth packets and i measured the quantity of packets received in a particular amount of time and i also measured their signal strength and as you can uh, observe here since the first step in this whole deployment was uh, estimating the path loss model we similarly uh, estimated the noise model so the first step in uh, achieving localization using ble is similar again you need to estimate uh, how the the rssi varies uh, according to the distance in this case we uh, estimated uh, how the probability of receiving a packet varies uh, with respect to distance and um, as you can see it again follows like an exponential decay so that's the first step and uh, then we basically uh, use this noise model and uh, applied some um, applied some uh, monte carlo methods to actually localize uh, customers indoors using ble and since we are a uh, sort of in a retail environment and the reason i chose behind 
doing these experiments in a library was to simulate the effects of having aisles or stacks uh, on on the communication uh, from the beacons, and uh, that sort of atten attenuation actually impacts the localization accuracy. So here you can see that if we only have one stack or two stack or uh, no stacks, then uh, this is the probability of receiving a packet. So we wanted to study that effect. We changed uh, the different parameters at which the beacons were sent. So we increased and decreased the frequency of sending the beacons. We then uh, basically changed the power at which uh, the beacons were sent. And we essentially built like a noise model which uh, encapsulates the distance, uh, the power, the frequency at which uh, the packets were sent. And eventually, we obtained uh, like a like a localization accuracy of uh, 1.11 meters, which seems uh, good enough. But uh, let's say if you want to have an actual deployment where you where you are having BLE beacons and you want to localize someone in in the free space, then uh, having a one meter error is e equivalent to like you predicting that the customer is uh, exploring pasta, but instead he's exploring uh, some rice options, some Chinese uh, rice noodles or something like that. So that can be the difference between a, a, a one meter error and a one centimeter error, let's say. So uh, that's what I did in this, uh, in this uh, summer intern project. So are, are there any questions? I I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So since I've talked about uh, localization and BLE, and uh, I believe everyone has like a pretty decent idea about uh, how MQTT works and how these protocols work, uh, a sample end-to-end -end application can look like this. So we will we can have sensors in a car which are at the edge, then we have like an MQTT proxy, uh, which basically uh, enables communication between uh, between the sensors and the microcontrollers or the subscribers. Then we can have an end-to-end -end pipeline where we can basically construct an emergency alerting, alerting system, or we can do retrospective querying uh, by building indexes on the data collected by using Elasticsearch or Grafana. So moving on, um, I'll talk. I'll talk briefly about AQI monitoring and uh, how it works. Uh, so this is like one of the lab projects I did uh, in in the IoT course at UIC. So uh, I'll just define the problem statement here. Uh, so what we had to do was that we wanted to uh, basically measure the in this case, we wanted to measure the uh, uh, the AQI uh, the uh, the air quality index inside Siebel, and we also wanted to measure the amount of unique devices <clears throat> we are finding in the corridor itself. And we did this by deploying AQI sensors, which were connected to Zigbee uh, to a Zigbee backbone. <clears throat> so here you can see uh, this is like. Um, the Zigbee backbone we had. And um, all the information from the AQI sensors were collected at a central uh, station. And uh, we, we were just simply printing out the AQI index uh, in a Flask application. So just to give you all uh, a sample video of how it worked, uh, let's see, let's make it present. So this is the first uh, place where we placed our AQI sensors. And this is Siebel. Um, pretty nostalgic, uh, given that COVID ruined everything. Uh, so this is the second place where uh, we see the, Zigbee, uh, see the Zigbee as well as the AQI node. This is the central place where we collected all the information <clears throat> coming in. And if I skip ahead to the video, we had another sensor placed right outside this class, which is uh, 1109. 
and we have another EQS sensor out here uh, along with the Zigbee node. So this is the deployment setup we had. So as you can see, one sensor was placed near a door. Uh, one was placed uh, near in, in a free corridor and one was placed uh, near a classroom. And we monitored the uh, scene for, for quite some time, for an hour. And this was some of the results which we obtained. So uh, we had like three groups who collaborated in deploying the whole setup. And as you can see here, um, uh, we can see that uh, this 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 was the sensor which was placed uh, out here. And let me let me just pull up uh, the actual report. Um, because this doesn't show that stuff. Yeah. So as you can see here, the sensor which we placed in the corridor had like a constant AQI value throughout, and the number of unique devices uh, were not didn't fluctuate a lot. It fluctuated in the end. Uh, then uh, near the door, the AQI sensor value fluctuated a lot because the door was like getting closed and open a lot uh, during this period in time. And then um, uh, you can see that here again, the AQI uh, value is very low out here. Uh, and since there was a class at like 6 p.m. in the evening or something like that, uh, there was a sudden spike in the uh, number of unique devices we counted. So the hypothesis was that uh, the, a the AQI value of any physical space is sort of correlated with the amount of unique devices in that particular space. But since uh, sniffing does not consider uh, sniffing does not consider where we are uh, in the physical space, it, it it detects the number of unique devices coming on from the inside of the classroom. And it detects that, okay, we have seen a unique device, but instead we should only focus on the devices in the corridor itself. So that's the first point. And you can see like lots of fluctuations in the numbers itself for counting unique devices. So each group had like a different algorithm for counting unique devices. And ours was the most correct one, in my opinion. Uh, and because you can see that there were no, like at this point, there, there are like 50 people who are, uh, detected by this group, which was new mark. Our group detected like a reasonable number of num uh, devices, which was like 10 to 15. Uh, so this is uh, this seems like a proper uh, algorithm because uh, the class roughly had like 60 students going in. Uh, another problem which you can see in here is that the AQI values are sort of very different. So here you can see it's around 100. Uh, it's roughly around 120 in this case, and here it is 40. So uh, many of these uh, devices need to be calibrated manually to ensure that uh, to ensure that the readings are proper. And messing up with the calibrations can lead to security issues, which we can see in one of the final slides. Um, Anikin, yeah. So when you mention number of uh, devices, is it like the mobile phones of students? Um, it is the MAC addresses of the students. Um, so coming quickly to the code, uh, we basically, uh, so um, any, so MAC address is like the device ID of any device. It's like the name of the device. So we usually use uh, MAC addresses to detect uh, uniqueness of any device. Um, so coming back to this code, so we had, we used this sniffing code for, uh, sniffing out uh, packets uh, or sniffing out devices. So this was running on an ESP8266, which was specifically used for detecting new devices. And it went through each of the channels and uh, detected like lots of uh, detected devices because as you can recollect, we have like uh, 14 different channels uh, in Wi-Fi and we are sniffing out packets in all these channels. And if you go back here, we are detecting for beacons uh, and clients uh, using ESP8266. And here you can see, we want to sort of record the RSSI value um, at which it was captured. 
And uh, let me see whether I can capture the MAC address somewhere here. Yeah, it's, it should be somewhere in here. So I believe the uh, SSID is sort of synonymous to the MAC address. Um, it's, it's just an identification tool. Um, yeah, and once it uh, detects uh, the MAC address, it just uh, communicates it to the central laptop over Zigbee. So that's that's the Wi-Fi sniffing part. For the AQI sniffing, uh, for the AQI part, it is like very, very simple. So this is the, uh, this is the Arduino code for uh, reporting sensor values. And as you can see here, it just, um, it first uh, connects to, uh, initializes a, the XP device or the Zigbee device, which it is connected to. And then uh, it just detects uh, sensor values and uh, sends it uh, between these, inter uh, sends it every minute uh, or so. So this delay is in uh, my uh, milliseconds. So 60,000 milliseconds is 60 seconds. Uh, and that's what we did in our case. And all, mm -hmm. yeah, go on. Yeah, I like, I don't know, like uh, this might be a silly question, but I'm still uh, not clear. So when you're saying other devices are like, is it about other sensors uh, which are in that area or people who are logged in, in from the laptop and counting number mm -hmm. of students, like, or is it phones? Mm -hmm. Like, how are you? Yeah, so that's a good question again. So uh, we were sniffing all the wireless packets in that space. So uh, any packets coming from any laptop, uh, any smartphone, or any specific device which is working on Wi-Fi. Uh, so it can be any Raspberry Pi working uh, on Wi-Fi as well. And uh, so whenever we want to transmit any packet, it is transmitted via a NIC, or it, which is referred to as a network integrated card. And uh, that every NIC has a specific uh, identification, which is called uh, the MAC address. Um, and uh, we are capturing that MAC address to basically uh, define the uniqueness. So if we get a unique MAC address, uh, then it means that it is a new device in, in the environment. I see. <clears throat> so if a student is in a classroom and their phone is connected to Wi-Fi and laptop is connected to Wi-Fi, does it count as two students or one student? Oh, it will count as two students because there is no way for us to know that these are two different students. Yeah, again. So that there will be a problem of overestimation here. Yeah. yeah, but uh, we we had to like build like a very naive application to specifically count the number of devices. Um, so that sort of does the job for us in this case. Yeah, and what we're doing in this case is that uh, we are simply uh, collecting all the data and we're storing it in a, a Postgres SQL database. So if you see here, uh, again, we register a callback. So whenever a new XP message is received, we just receive it and store it in a callback. Then we have a, a database um, running on a Raspberry Pi and uh, we just connect to that database using this username password. and we simply insert whatever uh, content we are getting in, in, into this database. So we are storing the timestamp, the node, and the value. And uh, as you can see here, uh, this is some of the data we had. So this is the identification of the ESP8266 device. Um, uh, so it is saying that, OK, we received, uh, wait, I think this should be. Uh, seeing the values, this is the identification of the AQI sensors itself. And uh, th these are the values it detected. And yeah, it says AQI data. Similar to Wi-Fi data, these are the IDs uh, of the ESP8266 devices. And this is the count which we obtained uh, every minute um, so. And um, we eventually built like a simple Flask application, which simply polls, uh, which again connects to the database and uh, queries for data uh, every five seconds. So we keep a refresh interval of five seconds and we just uh, displayed whatever data we got in there. 
And yeah, that that was that was uh, our sort of mini AQI monitoring setup uh, we had uh, for the lab. So any, any more questions about it? I think you might cover that in the data management that you showed CSV file and... Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. Yeah, and, and that sort of alludes us into the next uh, point of discussion where we talk about data management. Um, so, so since we have seen like all the data coming in, there should be some way to <clears throat> manage this data as well. So we have like data coming in from all sorts of sensors and in our typical industrial IoT application, this data can go to a command center and we can find long-term trends about what is happening with the warehouse and how everything is functioning in the factory. And we can also use sensor data to sort of uh, do failure prediction um, and detect anomalies in the system. Um, so this is how an end-to-end -end data workflow would work in an IoT system. So we have, in this case, we are just sort of abstracting out the protocols part because now we know how these devices talk to each other and how they collect data. So it's now all about how we process data. And uh, even before that, we should think about how we should store uh, sensor data. So this might be a pre this might be pretty contradictory, but CSVs are not ideal for storing unstructured sensor data. In my case, I used SQL and CSVs for like storing the data because our use case was like very uh, small and it was uh, the scope was very small for that many deployment. But for uh, actual deployment of such databases, uh, there are like proper uh, proper databases built by the community like MongoDB, InfluxDB, OpenTSD, GridDB, so that you can uh, use uh, you can use high throughput uh, real-time analysis uh, of the data and you can uh, have heavy ingestion of uh, the huge amount of sensor data coming into uh, the pipeline itself. So one of the questions, uh, so I won't talk about which which uh, which is the ideal database for IoT? I would sort of talk about the questions you should ask before picking any sort of database for your use case. And even before that, I would like to introduce the concept of uh, CAP. So this is like a standard, very famous theorem in uh, databases where uh, the whole concept is that <clears throat> in, if there is a uh, if there is any partition, uh, if there is any partition uh, in the storage or in the network, we can only choose between consistency and availability. So uh, I'll I'll define what consistency and availability means. So consistency means that uh, let's say you have like a partition database. Um, so let's say you have three copies A, B, C of some database. Um, then all the uh, copies of the databases uh, should be consistent with each other. So if uh, if the first copy, copy A, uh, says that uh, Aniket is graduated, um, and copies B and C say that Aniket is not graduated because uh, since it's like the graduation time, the update has not reached uh, copy B and C, then it means that the database is in sort of an inconsistent state. And uh, that's that's like a bad thing. So if uh, copy A goes down, then uh, my status would be that Aniket has not graduated because copies B and C say that I'm not graduated. So that's that's uh, that's the definition of being uh, having an inconsistent database. Uh, talking about availability, availability is that what is the probability that uh, your database will go down? So usually we have like down times when YouTube is not available or something of that sort. So that is that happens because uh, there are some maintenance issues and uh, there is very low availability uh, of the database available. And hence, you in that particular point in time, you cannot fetch anything from the database or write to it. Uh, so that's that's sort of the cap theorem in in a nutshell. And uh, to sort of uh, decide upon which database we should use for our IoT application. 
uh, we should sort of answer like some of the questions. So if your users need like immediate response and consistency is sort of not that important, so you would sort of go with availability. So all the social media sites, all the recommendation sites, uh, even search or Dropbox or Netflix, all of them use uh, would prefer to have an available database compared to a consistent one because they are sort of just replicating video content or file content on all of the servers. Then, uh, but if consistency is sort of important uh, to you and your users can wait, then we can have like, uh, for example, in, in a payment state, uh, in a payment system, or if you want to uh, reserve any booking or something of that sort, then you would uh, sort of uh, focus on consistency. Um, and each, each component of a system can have like different requirements. So we should really ask, is the system ingest heavy or will the system be queried heavily? So in the case of uh, IoT itself, uh, if we have like very low number of sensors, like few number of sensors, then it won't be ingest heavy. So you are fine with uh, a low end database, which does not have the guarantees of providing high throughput rights to that database. Uh, but if it, if it has like, uh, if uh, if it has if you have like uh, if you're in an industrial IoT setup and you have thousands of sensors so let's say six thousand sensors then which are publishing data every second then you will have like six thousand right operations to that database and then you'll need like a proper time series database to handle that much amount of data um, and secondly if the if you're using the system uh, uh, it all boils down to whether you're uh, using the system for retrospective query so you, you are just storing the database and just querying it very less frequently or you're doing it for real-time analytics so if you're doing for a real-time analytics one then you would need a database uh, which provides those guarantees and uh, basically uh, if you are just sort of storing it then you don't care about that much uh, you can easily pull up the data from the data source at any point in time um, so that's that's like the trade-offs we have and uh, the databases which I described here, they sort of uh, provide all these functionalities with some caveats uh, if you go into the nitty gritties. Uh, but if you want to like design an end-to-end -end system um, which has IoT components, then you need to answer at any at every stage uh, all these questions so that you can come up with an informed decision. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, uh, Aniket, uh, I had a thought that uh, since uh, like when you gave the example of making copies of database and inconsistency, can't just uh, one write a code that, okay, if I make a new entry, update it in all database? Oh, yeah. So, um, so that the abstraction you're talking about, that is actually implemented by MongoDB or OpenTSD. So, the APIs that they provide in that API, you just uh, write that, okay, write this entry. Uh, so first of all, you define a database that it will contain these many shards and these many partitions. And you just, when if you just write uh, cursor dot write this information, MongoDB in itself handles all that replication part. So, but the way it is replicated uh, depends on what you tell MongoDB to do. So you but you tell it whether uh, whether quality of services is important to you or whether uh, all these other factors are important to you. So depending on the requirement, uh, the database handles everything itself, but the API uh, which is provided to you in Python or any other language, uh, it you just have to like, like a single line of code to just insert any do uh, document or a record or retrieve any record. Mm -hmm. And um, moving on to, um, so uh, the storage part is one thing. And now moving on to the intelligence part of what we can do with the data, the, the possibilities are sort of becoming endless and people are inventing lots of things. And Alexa is like one of the very recent uh, technologies which sort of enable that. Uh, and you can see that here, uh, this is like an end-to-end -end pipeline of uh, how Alexa can be used uh, to automate uh, a home, to automate like your home using IoT. 
and it basically uh, uses uh, deep learning techniques uh, to translate any user speech into act an actionable output and this this system specifically is not using any sensor data but uh, this is one of the key components uh, which which can help which can be sort of easily integrated into iot and this is one of the first applications of deep learning i believe uh, in doing that so here uh, this is like an end to end uh, nlp pipeline which was developed by amazon and here a user says something which is converted to speech then you sort of uh, remove what the actionable item is and then you can uh, and then alexa can work as a microcontroller in this case and sort of uh give out commands to actuators to let's say turn on the music turn on the lights and stuff like that so alexa is sort of the microcontroller in this case which uh has this intelligence to carry out different actions and the sensor input in this case is just the user i guess uh but if we have like let's say different amounts of sensors then we can have like uh these architectures which are specialized for uh sensor data so this is one of the uh, one of an one of the upcoming architectures uh, deep sense for human activity recognition which takes in accelerometer and gyroscope data and it predicts actions for each specific interval um so yeah i won't go into the details of this uh but there are like specialized architectures for handling sensor data and it all depends on the use case as to what you want to do or do you want to do predictive analysis in which case you will come up with regression models or do you want to classify something like whether uh, a tap is running or not so maybe you won't need like deep neural networks to do that a simple if else condition would do so it all boils down to what the use cases are and what level of intelligence is uh, required to handle that use case um and let's say if we have like these deep learning uh, technologies uh, in built on the system and that is what is required instead of an if else statement then we would need like those amount of computational resources uh, available to run on a raspberry pi and that's where uh, edge computing is a uh, is an upcoming trend so here uh, we we have seen that uh, it's a common thing to just pump all the data into the cloud and the cloud does the analytics for us and we get the results but sometimes uh, there are like different problems to it so the first problem is that if we have like lots of sensors then it is really inefficient to send all the sensor data to the cloud because of uh, bandwidth constraints you don't want to pump in or overwhelm the cloud with lots of data and uh that's one of the things and also the latency so if you need to make quick decisions so if you are in an automotive iot setup and you cannot afford to get results from the cloud back to make any decision you need some a uh, local computation core to do that decision for you and that's where edge computing comes into picture where you have an edge infrastructure uh or which can be like a small raspberry pi so your microcontrollers can act as like edge devices or edge gateways uh which can uh process the data for you but let's say if you want to deploy like deep learning uh models on such uh, edge sensor on on uh, on such uh on such scenarios then you would need to beef up the raspberry pi with more computational power and uh there are like different uh edge accelerators to enable that and i can show you like one one such uh small demo about uh using intel's neural compute stick so this uh small device can be plugged into any usb port uh, like port into like any raspberry pi or even a laptop so i have this with me right now if you can see yeah and Yeah, I was thinking maybe if you can uh, stop sharing and show it. Uh... Oh yeah, sure, sure. I, I can show it to you. Um, let's see. We have. Yep. So, yeah, I can. If you can see, this is like a neural compute stick. Um, and it is specifically built for offloading, um, deep learning models on. uh low compute resources such as raspberry pi uh 
let me reshare my screen. And here we go. So let me just uh, plug this Raspberry, uh, sorry, this Intel stick into my laptop. Uh, your camera and... is not working. Oh, is it? Okay. This is weird. Is it working? Oh, yeah. All yeah. right. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, let me just stick it in my laptop. Um, and I've plugged the, uh, plugged the thing into my laptop. And let's try to uh, run this up. So I'll just, I have this simple tiny YOLO example here. And let me, first of all, so since I've plugged in uh, this uh, USB stick in here, I need to initialize, uh, I need to set up some variables so that my laptop recognizes this uh, Intel computer, uh, Intel stick. So I sort of initialize the open Vino environment in here. And now if we take a look at the code itself, uh, if I close this up, uh, and this is like the main file, you can see that, uh, all right, let me just, just run the example first so that uh, we can see some something going on and then we can talk about why this is happening. So let me load the config and let me load the video. Oh, oops. it's uh, I for input. So it has loaded the model. And as you can see in this tiny screen uh, that the YOLO model is sort of detecting person and it's not a great model to be honest, uh, but yeah, it sort of uh, puts out the point that we can detect, we can have some level of intelligence uh, using uh, the stick itself and it can accelerate computation. And to dive more into the coding part of it, here you can see that I'm loading some uh, configurations, which is here. And these configurations are basically the weights of the model and the architecture of the model. Then here I have this simple plugin, which says, says that MyRead is the uh, platform Intel uses. And I load the network using uh, the XML and the binary provide. So if I uh, go here and let me just put this up. So this uh, specifically describes the model. So you can see that these are the inputs, these are the convolutions, uh, the activation functions, max pooling layers. So this, the XML file describes the architecture of the model and the binary contains the actual weights of the model. And here we sort of load uh, that network in here. And then um, we sort of uh, predict uh, like, do a sample prediction to get the dimensions of the output. It's like a very technical thing. And uh, we load this network into our plugin. So this is the plugin here. And this was a separate entity, which was the network. And we load this plugin here. And then we each or uh, then we read um, each uh, frame and then we pass it through uh, the net. So here, exec net, which was uh, loaded into the plugin. Uh, it infers the frame and the output is sort of processed to detect objects. And it's like a very tiny amount of code. I mean, uh, the amount of code is sort of relative. So uh, a fair bit of code to just execute uh, a simple object detection model on uh, the neural compute stick. Yeah, and Aniket, uh, so just to be clear, when I deploy this on Raspberry Pi, like mm -hmm. all the uh, Python and ML libraries will be installed on Raspberry. It's just like for compute, it's asking uh, the edge device, uh, like the hmm. USB yeah. to do it. So, so you need to install these two libraries, which are the OpenVINO inference engines. And you need to have this uh, script, which is uh, readily available online to sort of initialize uh, 
to set up open vino so this is in one of my uh this is one of the aliases i'm using so this alias actually does uh this so it uh initializes the it it basically runs the script and if we take a look at the script um uh, what it does is that it basically reads and all the thing it uh sets up the library parts as you can see and it basically sets up the whole environment so if i try to run the same command in another terminal it won't work because it will say that there is no such file or directory so all the setup uh, all the setup is provided by uh, the official website of the neural computes tech just a thought can i like uh, attach this on my mobile phone oh no so uh, uh, if your mobile phone supports uh, the environment then it it can but usually our uh, i believe our phone cannot uh, support this intel device uh, but phones are in fact coming up with more edge computing power uh, to process to have like tiny ai models working on so uh, let's say the modern phones which uh, let's say oneplus or even google are developing they have these tiny chips inserted in them to sort of detect faces or to detect the lighting on your face so our our even our phones are getting more and more smart uh, as uh, as as we are progressing uh, but we cannot use this particular intel stick in our phone <laughs> yeah yeah i read somewhere that apple is like mm-hmm. has developed like its own chip for like oh yeah to progr- dev- uh, like use uh, core ml on hmm oh yeah yeah the the that's that's the moves law right everything is getting smaller uh i don't know at what point it will stop getting smaller but <laughs> it's great until it gets small yeah so yeah on a concluding note uh, i'll just discuss briefly about some of the security issues uh, related to iot so one of the first security issue is that uh, like over 90% of the transactions on iot devices are unencrypted so by unencrypted what i mean is that you can simply sniff out packets from thin air and just read out what the content of the packets are so we have already seen how sniffing is sort of done using esp8266 so that is used for sniffing wifi packets um and if i sort of again allude to that piece of code uh, i can show you this so here we are sort of uh, the we had like a wifi sniffer and we have we were sniffing out rss and the channel but we can also uh, extract like uh, the data packet from it like the payload itself and we can get all sorts of information from in there uh, and uh, there are there there do exist sniffers for sniffing out bluetooth packets or even zigbee packets and most of these uh, transmissions uh, are sort of unencrypted and can be seen by people externally and those can have like very bad consequences uh, in the sense that let's say if you have uh, someone snooping into your home automation system and it is uh, the person is simply extracting all the information you have in there uh, then it can know what the temperature of your house is what lights are going on and if 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 someone uh, sort of hacks into your system then it will be pretty bad for you uh, as your home will be a complete mess and um, so the second security issue is uh, of botnets so firstly i'll sort of uh, describe what botnets are like the concept of uh, botnets itself so um, in in a distributed setup so let's say uh, you uh you have uh, you are watching a video from a youtube server how it works is that you send a request to the server it the server serves a video and you are able to watch that video uh, easily but let's say um if someone wants to uh crash the youtube server so what they do is they uh, they, they launch a denial of service attack where you have like multiple compromised devices which have been hacked and all these devices uh, send uh, a request to the server and uh, since the server cannot like sort of uh, 
manage all the requests coming in uh you won't be able to watch that particular video because your request will not be served and the request from all the devices coming from the botnet is uh, coming in so a botnet is essentially a group of devices which are compromised by hackers and an attacker can use these group of devices to launch sort of uh denial of service attacks or it can also uh, use these group of devices to basically do any sort of bad things and the only power of botnet is uh, the quantity of devices in that particular botnet so if you have more number of devices then you can do more destructive things because you can uh, easily send more requests in and do more uh, uh, more malicious stuff so uh, traditionally we had uh, by device we we can always imagine having like a big computer or a big laptop and uh, the the quantity of devices in a botnet was not was not that huge but since the advent of uh, iot itself the devices are sort of getting smaller and it is sort of very easy to hack into uh, a particular device and hence the the size of the botnets are increasing and these botnets are sort of used in uh, manipulating smart power grids so what these botnets do is that you can easily fluctuate uh, the the electricity flow in in a power grid and it can be used to do more malicious stuff uh, another example is uh, this for for uh, this related to uh, bitcoin mining so there was a mirai botnet in 2017 where multiple iot devices like uh, were, were were hacked and compromised and were used for mining bitcoins and since bitcoins uh, since the account for bitcoins is sort of untraceable uh, the source uh, it is very difficult to track the source and again uh, there are instances where uh, there with hackers sort of exploit uh, the calibration issues related to sensor devices so uh, a lot of attacks can be made on the sensors itself so volkswagen uh, got into some trouble because uh basically what they did is that uh they faked some of the reports by manipulating the calibration of the sensors to get under the regulation so all these sorts of things usually happen and um and in medical iot as well one needs to be uh very careful about uh, what devices are inserted into the patient so let's say if we are uh, considering an example of pacemaker so uh ideally we would like the pacemaker to be installed in one shot and be done for it but sometimes uh we can we will need some uh we will need the ability to have to provide some updates to that pacemaker itself uh now it is infeasible to again operate the patient and remove the pacemaker update the pacemaker and just insert insert, insert it again because uh that's not a very smart thing to do uh so what uh Uh, so what people do is that uh, they have this wireless capability with pacemakers with which you can uh, sort of install updates wirelessly and sort of uh, ensure that the software is up to date in any pacemaker but this wireless ability can uh, potentially unlock a new threat wherein you can sort of an external hacker can exploit the vulnerab- vulnerabilities in these devices and these devices can be hacked uh, as well so uh since uh, there are the promise provided by iot is like huge but we also need to be careful of such uh, security issues uh and here is just a, a very tiny example of uh what i discussed right now and there are like many many security issues in iot uh but yeah this is this is uh like the whole picture and the whole content i have for today um any questions here yeah. Oh my god Aniket you covered a lot of stuff and I'm I can't believe like you didn't take a break in this like 2 plus hour okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you so I think uh, I I I was really uh, surprised and a bit shocked when you were discussing security uh, and uh, like how Uh, i think uh, you showed me a demo where using wireshark like i could mm-hmm. literally oh, yeah. see, uh how one 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can do like a short Wireshark demo where you can sniff uh, packets from uh, thin air. So Wireshark is a utility to sort of debug networks, but it can be also used to snoop in what is happening at your home at any point in time. So here you can see these are the network packets at my ho- uh, at my home right now. And this is the IP address I have. So if I open this particular packet, uh, let's see. I can easily see what uh, who the sender is, who the receiver is. So the center is my laptop itself. And this uh, destination must be the IP address of Zoom, of a Zoom server. And it is working on this particular pro- protocol. And this is sort of the application data. So currently, the application data is encrypted. It is usually encrypted uh, in all in a, in, usually. But if you are using, let's say, HTTP or uh, any other protocol which is not encrypted, then you can um, basically see what the contents of the messages are. And also, moreover, uh, we know what the uh, end-to-end, uh, so we know the source and the destination IP addresses as well. So I can easily uh, know which websites are being uh, pinged from the local network I have. So I can totally know what websites my roommates are watching, uh, when they are watching, and all that stuff. So yeah, there are like some pretty powerful utilities to uh, detect uh, or sniff what is happening in a network. And this is like just a small applic- uh, use case of it. Yeah, like I found that pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think like uh, we have comments that you like uh, from Sujay that he found the session quite comprehensive. He learned a mm-hmm. lot and even I totally agree with that, that it's like in in the whole duration, there was not a single second I got bored and everything like you explained was quite uh, comprehensive and the use cases uh, really opened uh, my perspective of what are ways one could deploy this. So mm-hmm. great, great yeah. job on such amazing presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And it's a pleasure of mine to present the stuff here as well. Yeah, yeah. I could feel the passion about the topic. Uh, I think I have one question before uh, we end, end the session. So what is your piece of advice to people who want to develop more skills in this area? Like, And since like you also explored uh, this part, which is not uh, part of the curriculum, so any mm-hmm. course, books, or strategies you recommend? So I would just uh, recommend to do lots of uh, do-it-yourself projects. Um, so it will require some amount of investment uh, uh, because the, you need to buy the devices. Uh, but having like, an hands, like a hands-on experience with devices usually helps. So uh, it may not be like futile applications like just turning on an LED light. You can create some cooler stuff like uh, you can control a Raspberry Pi sync hole, like a YouTube ad blocker in your home. Or you can um, just mess up around with things to make something smarter. Like you can create an app which is controlled via Raspberry Pi and it commands uh, your switch to like switch something off. So uh, it will require some kind of monetary investment. Um, But if you want to learn like new things uh, in this domain, it's usually better to just do it yourself and explore more projects. I would also recommend to learn more uh, content related to computer networks because that sort of forms the backbone of this whole topic. Um, so from my experience in TAing the IoT course as well, which I did last semester, uh, it is very important to have like a very strong background of computer networks because that helps you in debugging what is going on in the network. Um, and uh, that's that's one thing. Uh, I, ha- I think I have one question again here. So uh, what alternative or custom microcontrollers are available in the market? So there are different boards. So as I pointed out uh, before that the community is very heterogeneous. Um, I- I'm only familiar with Raspberry Pi, Arduino Uno, and uh, ESP8266 and ESP32 because 
there are there is like enough documentation with which you can work and uh, connect devices to but there are like more closed ecosystems where they have their own specific microcontrollers with their own specific compatible devices um so it's really difficult uh, to pick pick that up so uh, if you want to have like a general use case uh, then it's better to start with the raspberry pi and arduino and since that knowledge is sort of transferable across microcontrollers even if you pick up one device and sort of uh, obtain mastery in that then you need, you can sort of uh, do it for other microcontrollers as well cool and i i think uh... i want to thank you uh, for all the efforts which went behind in the presentation i i like i think uh, we are both in a atmosphere yeah. where everyone is like graduated and we are chilling out the last few <laughs> days on campus and spending time yeah. to work on it like uh, means a lot and mm-hmm. also want to like thank uh, like congratulate you for uh, your uh, job at google so god oh, excited thank you thank you so much here yeah. pretty excited as well yeah. awesome so yeah that's it for the session thanks a lot everyone who are watching on youtube and joined this session and uh, also like sujay especially like for asking such uh, good questions thank you